Well, good morning and uh, or good afternoon now. Welcome to the, uh, our uh, Institute Research Seminar. Um, Shirley is enjoying the wonderful weather in Florida right now, so is not here to introduce me. I have great regret. I would prefer to be doing this by webcast from Florida, but I'm not so lucky. The, um, just to introduce myself briefly, my name is Dominic Covey, and I'm the uh, director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. Uh, professor in the uh, Faculty of Science and uh, uh, very much involved in health informatics and uh, both in, on the campus and, and around the country. So what I'll talk to you about today will be uh, work that stemmed from earlier work that I did. I was in the consulting industry as first an academic in Toronto, computer science, and then spent 15 years as a consultant. And during my consultant work, I had a lot of opportunity to work on workflow. Uh, re-engineering, particularly in health environments. A uh, large number of laboratories, uh, clinical laboratories, and also a fairly large number of diagnostic imaging departments in both Canada and the United States. And some of the challenges that I had in uh, doing that kind of work will be clear in what I'll talk about today. It was the stimulus for it, but under uh, NSERC, uh, uh, we, we obtained uh, the support, and I'll give credit for this at the end, from AGFA, to create a chair here in health informatics, and that was then uh, turned into an executive industrial research chair by NSERC. So this is NSERC and AGFA-funded research, and they deserve a great deal of credit for the risks they've taken in that. The, uh, I'll talk interchangeably about business processes and workflow. I mean nothing different by those two things, although I tend to use business processes as macroscopic entities, like parts of a department or a whole department uh, a business process would be registration of a patient and workflow as microscopic, but there really isn't any uh, meaning between the two uh, activities. I'll talk first about the uh, nature and components of workflow. Uh, just mention some of the commercial workflow packages and the fact that uh, it's an interesting uh, situation. We have so many of them. The concept of workflow engines, which are to uh, turn uh, descriptions of workflows into actual uh, processes that can be executed on a machine, uh, the relevance and benefits of this research, and then uh, talk a bit about workflow analysis and representation. This is the work of a large number of people, as you'll see. I'm probably the least of those. I, I mean, I need to give uh, credit to them uh, completely. Uh, then at the end, I'm going to talk about a few words about uh, health informatics related to this concept of workflow and some acknowledgments, and uh, um, if I have time, a few odd slides. So the first part. Basically, when you do this work, you, you kind of see workflow everywhere. Someone says, well, a recipe is workflow, yes. A clinical protocol that tells how to deal with a patient, that's workflow, yes. How you run a department is a workflow. How you write a program is a workflow. The process in a, in a program is a workflow. So every aspect uh, of what we do practically has a, uh, uh, can be described as a workflow. And it means that what we do in workflow research is applicable to virtually any kind of process. Our particular interests are in the diagnostic imaging uh, particularly, but other departments in uh, health organizations and how workflow is processed and executed, and clinical protocols where we give physicians a specific, hopefully best practices way of treating and evaluating and treating patients. But it applies to almost anything. Uh, just the simple ideas here, the components of workflows are very simple. We have agents, there are pe things like people, but an agent could be an instrument or it could be a software agent, an intelligent agent or non-intelligent agent. Uh, so these are the people who do something, uh, carry something out. Objects are any kind of object, any kind of entity in the, uh, that can be processed, like data, documents, images in diagnostic imaging department, physical samples, in a laboratory, they're often called aliquots, where they're poured from you, the blood brought in or the urine brought in into little bottles. Anything you can think of is an object. Uh, it could be a barcode label. It could be um, an RFID tag, I suppose, anything like that. Activities are the things that are done by typically agents on objects, so processing that occurs. And by the way, if anybody wants a copy of these slides, I'd be happy to email them to you. Um, so the activities are any kind of action, human action. It could be computations. It could be any kind of processing generally. Uh, generally, people also recognize there are rules. I'm trying to avoid a lot of uh, use of rules by 
uh, some of the work that we're doing. But rules are any kind of constraints, uh, behavioral or otherwise, conditions, limits, boundaries on any of these. So uh, a rule might be this agent cannot perform this test but could perform that test. They're qualified uh, competency-wise to do that. Um, basically, uh, business process is a composite of workflow components. Uh, it, may produce pro it does produce products, typically, either data or reports, images, that go out. So they're inputs to the process and outputs of the, uh, to the process. Input might be a patient. Output might be a diagnostic image. And uh, there can be any number of things that start a process. Most of the time in the health domain, the start of a process is through an order. Uh, there's a concept called order entry, where you capture a description of what you want done, a laboratory test, which laboratory test, done on which patient, uh, with any conditions that you want uh, considered, like capturing the blood in a certain way. Uh, it could be a surgical specimen. It could be anything like that. So. Uh, Business processes are typically made up of these things in combinations. So workflow, a workflow, agents receive objects, perform activities, operate under rules, and transmit objects to agents. That simply describes a workflow. If you want a diagram of a workflow, almost any flow chart or process map yeah, is an adequate uh, object, uh, an ob adequate description of a workflow. So there's some process that goes on, whatever it might be, typically able to be diagrammed as a uh, as a flow chart or a process map or, or some sort of graph. To give an example in healthcare, a uh, receptionist, let's say in diagnostic imaging, uh, that's the agent, receives a requisition, which is an object, the order to do a test, created by a physician who's an agent, checks it for completeness, that's checking maybe against a checklist or something like that, make sure the order is complete, um, uh, lists the minimum data required, uh, in this thing and approves the activity. So, for example, if the order came in without why the test was to be done, it's called the clinical information, then the test would not be done until uh, the receptionist contacted the uh, doctor on the floor and said, why are you doing this test? It's often very important. Do people do tests for the wrong reasons. And examination uh, is scheduled, which is an activity. Uh, the examination will be performed later, and there'll be an exam time sent back to the ward or to the patient directly, saying what time, which kind of test will occur. That's a typical thing here. Here are typical representations of a workflow. Probably the most interesting one is the ability to use declarative techniques, the ability to write descriptions of workflows, rather than having to uh, say how it's done, describe what's being to be done, and then have it uh, decomposed into the how. Uh, typically, when you're Reengineering a department, what it means is something isn't as efficient or effective as it can be. So we're going to change the process. We're going to potentially even change the products. Uh, that's the nice thing about computing. It can build new processes on it. You can also build new products on it. So you take typically some existing workflow. Often we start with something. It could be the way the department is run right now. Or it could be the way other people run it that we'd like to be like, an exemplar workflow. For example, uh, Maher has had a chance to change the workflow in optometry, and we know it's the best practice, so we were, we're going to use that as our starting point in creating a new uh, optometry clinic. Uh, process map is the very standard tool. If you have Visio, it's probably the most common package, and you have many representations in there, but process maps are the popular one because it allows you to put not only what's done, but where it's done. It allows you to add geography easily or any kind of... Uh, another dimension if you want to the workflow. Uh, very common software. Typically, this work of documenting the department is done by some kind of a process analyst. Might be a nurse trained to do this, or it may be, hopefully, an industrial engineer or someone close to that who is uh, competent in, in doing up these diagrams. And it'll be a starting point for consideration of where we want to go from here. And so you have staff, a group of staff, that will look at this. And typically, in reengineering, you create some sort of cross-disciplinary team of, in a, in a laboratory, it might include technologists, it might include uh, support staff, it will include, include a clinical uh, laboratory scientist or a physician, uh, could include a pathologist, and so on. That cross-disciplinary team will be examining this workflow and saying, you know, can we do it better? So typically what you do is move things around, add new things, delete some things, and modify components. It's a famous thing in reengineering, don't automate, obliterate. Why? We'll get rid of useless processes. If the thing does not produce value, get rid of it. 
And a lot of things can be saved from these environments. But sometimes you run into trouble, as you'll see. The analyst comes along and says, uh, let's get rid of this thing. Let's delete this component. It's redundant. The market manager says you can't do that because we're required by regulation to have that particular process there, to have someone check it and document it. How could you have known that looking at a Visio process map or a flowchart? It's not there. It's not documented. It's not part of the how. It's the why something is done. So it gives you the first inkling that there are other dimensions of workflow. So there's a body of knowledge uh, not expressed in a workflow uh, that's critically important in understanding a workflow. And that's one of the weaknesses of the way in which we document workflows today. How can we possibly compare or evaluate workflows if we don't know what this why knowledge is? Like, why are we doing this process? We could eliminate something that's essential, example just given. I want to point out, too, and uh, there are many ways of, of saying this, but workflow exists at many levels of granularity. At the top level, and you're familiar with this, you have a radiology department, requisition and patient in, and report and patient hopefully out at the other end. That's a very high level view, but it can go higher than that. It could be the whole organization. So if you have a, uh, we, talk, we talk about a macro service, so a diagnostic imaging Department is the highest level of service in, in the particular way we think about it. Now, this macro service, the department, is composed of uh, subservices. Uh, these include the patient reception service. We, I call these business processes, but call them anything you want. Uh, patient reception service uh, lets the patient be received and then sent to the proper room with the proper documentation so that the examination can be done in the diagnostic imaging department. The uh, that, that business process for re reception, there are many others. There could be one for reporting tests, one for doing each kind of exam, one for checking out some other things. Uh, might be procedures that are done. Those services uh, here at this level are composed of microservices. So within this business process, there are further processes. For example, patient comes into the department, someone goes to the patient's gurney, let's say it's on a gurney, and maybe gets the patient's chart, checks it out looks at the ID back, make sure it's the right patient. Uh, all of those steps, for example, verifying uh, identification, are themselves sub-workflow processes. And then every one of those is composed of further uh, processes. For example, reading and, and verifying the requisition form itself. That's a sub-process again. And you can keep going downward, uh, however deeply you want to. Uh, at the bottom are some atomic tasks that are fundamental tasks that are, that are performed. And whatever those might be, they'll vary according to uh, the depth to which you want to go and what kind of process you're looking at. Different kinds of workflow exist, just so you know the words. Clinical workflow is the process that's to be performed on a patient with a specific problem or diagnosis. So you might be, for example, uh, in a process that says, uh, we need to ask you a bunch of questions and get health information from you. Then we need to order a radiological exam. And we can't do anything else until we see the results of that exam. That's a clinical protocol. It says what to do and pretty well also in what order to do it so that it's properly done. You might do a less expensive test before a very expensive test because if the less, less expensive test is diagnostic, you may not need to do the very expensive test. Uh, operational workflows are different and uh, overlap with clinical workflows. They're the workflows mandated in a department. If you're going to do a certain kind of exam, someone will have created a procedure for doing that exam according to best practices. So that, will, that protocol for operating uh, in that environment, doing an exam, will overlap with and uh, include the, uh, be included in the overall clinical protocol. It'll be a sub-protocol of that. Now, every procedure that's done and every task that's done will in turn have a workflow. And in fact, individual physicians will have different workflows because they have preferences. And one of the things information systems contain is a way of documenting the physician preference. So these workflows will be informed or adapted to different individuals' preferences. You have system management workflow, too. We have an information system running in the diagnostic imaging department. It itself has a workflow. For example, each day it might need to be backed up. Uh, you might need to do integrity checking on it. Periodically, you might want to do some sort of a summarization report on what's done. That's system management workflow. And there are many other kinds of workflows. I also think of cognitive 
uh, flows, instead of saying workflow, cognitive flows, the way in which people think about things. And that's a big problem in systems, of having a system that is able to process information in a way that's complementary to and directly uh, aligned with uh, the, the work, the thinking flow of a person. Some of the issues is that uh, include things like that all of these workflows are executed simultaneously. There are many, many workflows that go on simultaneously, but they're independent. The clinical protocol and operational workflow are completely separate, de defined by different people, and they have different purposes. But they interact, and that creates a problem in dealing with the complexity of, of overlapping and interacting workflows. They uh, are the care process. So when you talk about the care process. It isn't just a clinical protocol about how the patient is to be dealt with. It's all these sub-workflows that are called into uh, action by the clinical protocol, and they make up the complete care process. They're very detailed. If you take a laboratory, clinical laboratory, and papered the walls of this room with, with uh, flow charts that were barely readable, you could probably paper all four walls and maybe the ceiling with the workflows. They're very complex workflows if you try to really document them deeply. So human beings looking at them, we have literally, in reengineering, done that. Paper the room. You walk around looking at it, much like an art gallery, looking and saying, well, can we change this? That's the only way you can get the picture of the workflow is to see. And sometimes those workflows interact across with other workflows in other departments, and they have to also, at least the point of entry to the other department needs to be documented. Uh, in order to work with them, uh, and, and to deal with them and to evaluate them is a major challenge. It's not easy to do this for human beings. Now, what's come along is that uh, commercial packages have been created uh, to be able to represent workflows at various levels of complexity. You may have seen a couple of them. The uh, one in here was uh, uh, under the WebSphere context at the bottom. And... Uh, there was another one from a file that was very familiar to people a long time ago as a document management system used in insurance companies. Uh, these, uh, these systems, these, these uh, different systems here contain these workflow elements that allows you to re-describe what's going to happen in that environment. So you may have a, a, a package that has a standard workflow and you can go in and modify it. Those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, have you heard of ERP systems, Enterprise Resource Planning, sometimes called ERM or Resource Management Systems now. These are sort of the back office systems, the financial, human resources, uh, all those kinds of things, systems. People have taken ERP systems and they, they reprogram them to fit an environment. And that's one of the reasons that huge costs come about. I know of one hospital that targeted its ERP at 16 million. Last time I looked at it, it was at $16 million to install it. What they were doing, in fact, was changing the workflow description in these systems to suit a very idiosyncratic environment and a huge cost associated with this. And one of the big cost overrun areas in healthcare and other industries is ERP or ERM systems because we attempt to make uh, them like us rather than trying to imitate something that already exists. Big, big, big issue. Interestingly, some of these are just useful for describing workflows. Others can be embedded in systems, and I'll talk about that in a, in a couple of seconds, where you, in fact, can describe the workflow using these techniques, and then the system will execute this workflow in a way that works with all the other application's components. One of the big issues is many of them uh, lack the complexity of operations in a health system. This is a particular package uh, where one of the local hospitals attempted to use the LiveLink workflow system, which is a very basic one, and was unable to represent the processes in an inter-application uh, integration kind of context. I'll talk about that if you're interested. To, to, so you understand what I just said, the workflow concept, uh, workflow engine concept, very simple one is that if I could take a workflow and describe it either with a uh, process map or a graph or de declaratively as a series of formal language uh, statements, if I could do that and I have diagnostic imaging operational workflow and here's the work process, I could represent this, say using a technique like this, and translate it into a form uh, that this operational workflow could be processed by a workflow engine software, which interacts with other components of a radiology information system. And suddenly I have the ability to reprogram this system here using ordinary people, process analysts. So the, the, the reason this idea is important is that a great amount of, of uh, code in hospital information systems, particularly departmental information systems, is in fact workflow. 
So if I can externalize this and be able to change it, I can create a version of the system specific to my own interests. And of course, I also undertake the danger of screwing it up by, by getting an immense complexity and not dealing with it properly. So the workflow engine concept is very, very important because it used to be that if I didn't have this in here, the workflow is hard-coded in the system. And if I have to go in and reprogram, it requires programmers, and it requires the vendor, typically, to create a version, a separate version, for the site. And it's been shown in industry that the concept of a version per site is a good way of companies to commit suicide, because they end up maintaining all these versions. Well, now, the only thing you're modifying is, is, is this workflow, and you can test it and get it working and so on, and now you've got the ability to program systems. It also reduces the barriers to the use of the technology by using uh, analysts, ordinary people, the workflow team, to actually change the system in, in the ways you need to change. There are examples of this on the market. Uh, interesting, one company I won't mention brought this out, and initially it was extremely poor, poor performance. You can imagine there might be some performance problems here, but in a few months was able to correct that. So we have examples of this right now in healthcare. Almost every vendor in the systems space in the healthcare market is looking at technology like this. BizTalk is a very common uh, technology that they're using, by the way. Well, we looked at workflows and recognized that the, the, the workflow, as represented in uh, process maps and so on, uh, uh, was a problem. We also recognized that in healthcare, uh, workflows aren't stable. Uh, it's similar to war, actually. Have you ever heard the statement that after uh, that a, the war plan only exists for two days before it falls apart? It, you have to specialize what you're doing. You have to focus it. Uh, so in the fog of war, uh, you, you can't keep doing the trick that you thought you were going to do. You have to adapt. And that adaption uh, is critical. Well, it turns out in healthcare, it's sort of like that. If you start a process with all the things you think you know what's going to happen, you're partly through the process and the patient says, stop. And you have to stop. You have no choice. Or the room is down. Or you've done a test on the patient, discovered the hemoglobin is too low for the chemotherapeutic agent you're going to use. Everything changes the protocol. Millions of things change, and I'll talk about that. It's a mention that we use the term semantics, and people hate this term because really uh, it, it's a, a, uh, not a good term. Uh, we use the term contextual knowledge here. So every workflow exists with related contextual knowledge. And if you want to know what semantics is, this is the uh, Oxford uh, English Dictionary version of the, of the thing here. While syntax is uh, the order in which things appear, typically you know, the grammar of a sentence. A workflow has a start, middle, and end, that kind of thing, or a composition does. A workflow has an input, process, output. That's an example of the syntax. So really what a flowchart is showing you is syntax, mostly. There's some embedded uh, knowledge in there, but very, very basic knowledge, more like uh, the grammar of a sentence than the actual meaning of a sentence. Classic workflow is mostly syntax. It says what's going to be done in what order, under what conditions, uh, where agents, activities, and objects are the things. And sometimes there are semantics associated with the workflow. If you look at a workflow, it might say this process must be done in 10 minutes or this process typically takes five minutes. And sometimes you'll see associated with some workflow in industry uh, things like the human resources required. For example, this, need, this, this step needs to be done by a technologist, a certified technologist. And what to do if there is no technologist? How do you escalate the process to the next level so that the process can continue? Well, a, ch a charge technologist might be appropriate to do the process. So the ordinary technologist versus the charge technologist. We talk about the concept of comprehensive workflow, where we couple the contextual knowledge uh, and where we're looking at both classic syntactical workflow and the concept of contextual knowledge flow related to workflow. And to bring this out, uh, here's the workflow I, I described before. Requisition comes in, we receive it in the uh, reception area, check the requisition against the checklist for completeness and approve the scheduling of the exam. We can symbolically uh, represent a flow just like that, That's, uh, and you could have bring in the checklist if you want from the side, but it, just to show it simply, it's a series of, of sequential circles. If we add the contextual knowledge, it includes things like why this step is being done. So think of it as three dimensions on this part, on each of these, or n dimensions on each of these. 
Like, why are you doing it? What's the objective, the purpose for which it's being done? What's the value of this step? What's the cost of this step? Uh, are there uh, regulations that require it? In other words, is there a required dimension, no matter what? Whatever that set of, of stuff is, it needs to be directly correlated with this step. So a true representation of the workflow would not just include uh, the individual steps, would include each of these dimensions, and there n of them, however many you want, and what's interesting is that there is a flow in these dimensions. There's a natural way in which this should be done so that some early purpose, for example, or something is met and then more the next part of the purpose and so on. There's actually a flow or cost as from each step is another example of that. So we look at workflow plus contextual knowledge flow in, in what we're trying to represent. The real trick here is representing knowledge in association with the basic workflow steps. So that's one of the research challenges. The point of doing uh, the next step here I need to raise with you is that if I'm doing a workflow in healthcare, I said, well, the patient can say stop. Well, lots of things can happen beyond the patient choosing in real time that I've had enough. The care provider can say, I don't want to do it that way. Uh, I want to change it because of some reason. Alterations based on patient status might be a reason. The department situation, some equipment out of order may change it. Protocol may change it because the low hemoglobin, administration may change it and say, well, for this group of patients, you should use a less expensive device or a less expensive test or less expensive contrast material in diagnostic imaging. The family may intervene, you know, an example of, of the kinds of things. We have to realize, too, that these processes in healthcare entail significant uh, injury potential and death as, as possible outcomes, as well as, of course, a successful event. The kinds of things that influence uh, the, uh, the, the steps, and this is just a partial list, preconditions, what the patient came in with, they were just running or uh, something like that, they can't, the test can't be done. Uh, the diagnosis, the clinical state, uh, the potential that you're going to have a good effect. If a patient is, is sick, you have to make a, a judgment under basic rubric of medicine to say, is this going to help? And it might not with that patient at that time help to do this test. It would be better to take the patient and immediately take the patient to surgery. Previous history, their allergies, that happens a lot to certain media that might be injected into the patient. Uh, I mentioned consent. Current medications, you discover the patient just took a big whop of, uh, of vitamin E, which cuts down, uh, causes your blood to not clot very quickly. So that can be a real problem. Uh, many, many other things that can cause it. So this variability in healthcare is the rule rather than the exception. The exception is things would go exactly lockstep. So we have to take into an idea that workflows are constantly altered. And uh, uh, Bill Malley came up with a term of describing the two kinds of workflow. One where it's prefixed or set as prescribed workflow, which you can follow and is rare, and the other assembled workflow, where the services that are uh, done at each step are assembled in real time dynamically. And that's the model that we're looking at. Uh, just uh, the preparation, I not really need to deal with this, but the research we're trying to deal with is, can computer-based processes be used to measure, analyze, and evaluate complex healthcare processes and help to achieve appropriate levels of patient safety, cost, outcome quality, and regulatory compliance? That's the broadest statement of the kind of work that we're doing. Um, the fact that there are many kinds of uh, factors that uh, can be chosen, uh, and that uh, cause us to have the realization that there are many real-time elections. Standard protocols is unproductive rigidity. In fact, standard protocols that have been evolved are often rejected by physicians as cookbook medicine. Do A, do B, do C. Uh, and, and there are reasons they do that. And one of the particular problems, the reason we're interested in time, is the time dimensionality that's pushed onto the uh, process. But the result is, that your attempt to get best practices of medical care end up with physicians not complying with the therapeutic regimens that you've described. So if standard protocols are ignored, or you have to have a zillion variants which are impossible to manage. Gives this feeling of straitjacketed, as a term that's often used by physicians, and time can become one of the really big issues. The dynamic workflow concept is that uh, processes are composed of services chosen in real time. And uh, although you can lay out all of them. There could be hundreds of thousands of possible sequences that could be chosen. Uh, they based on variables like I've listed. 
uh, workflow in the form of a, of a flow chart cannot be described. Uh, it, it will vary so much that it, it will have too many uh, variants, so that's a, that's a big issue. Actions are executed in, in dynamic situations, and workflow is, in fact, the real workflow is the historic record of what did occur. So there is a workflow, and it's what happens afterward. So pre-describing pre workflow is essentially not uh, good, but you'll get a workflow that was finally what was achieved, and it will vary from time to time. And what's interesting is, and there's more and more work going on in this, is workflows can be mined. So you can look at what's the average workflow that's been uh, happened in a process. And you can look at well, what's the most efficient of those, or you know, what did we learn from those? What are the, were there any patterns? things happening before other things. If those patterns turn out to be inappropriate, you can go back and intervene so you can mine the workflows for opportunities for improvement. And basically, in terms of uh, current approaches, we basically just capture these kinds of things, like test sequencing, constraints, durations, things like that. But time is very inflexibly represented. I won't have time today to go into that, but Ken McKay has been doing work related to the representation of time of uh, different ways of representing time and making the representation of time extremely flexible. Just the ability to choose services in different orders helps with that too. Um, anyway, these uh, current abstractions, the classic workflow, doesn't deal with things like, why does a particular business process exist? Why is it there at all? What are we trying to achieve with it? A business process could be reception, it could be reporting, or it could be checking something. Uh, what kinds of objectives is addressed? What are the implications of not executing it? Uh, what's its value? Where value might be in patient outcomes or dollars or safety or something like that, and what are its costs? None of these are really addressed within classical representations of workflow. So if we're going to deal with this, we need to deal with those dimensions I showed you in the previous diagram. There are many different descriptions we've had of them. Uh, these are just a list here of, of uh, things that uh, easy one to understand is competency requirements for the human resources uh, in required to do a particular process and how to deal with uh, if that type of person is not available. If we had this information, in addition to the wall papered with the uh, syntactic workflow, we would have the ability to really make decisions about what was the most appropriate uh, thing to do in terms of reorganizing this workflow. So we could evaluate a process, we could analyze it, we could compare processes to one another, we can compare uh, conformance of a process to its requirements. Right now there's no, no way of doing that. We can mine historic workflows and predict likely courses of care and use these to manage the process better by looking at patterns and what worked better and was more successful and so on. So we've created a, another level of, of, of looking at the history of the patient, in this case the history and the workflow. Some of the benefits, if we did this, was is that new methods for healthcare process analysis, it alone is very valuable. And uh, uh, I'll skip the contracts thing, but uh, we'd have the techniques to deal with process customization where we can reconfigure but remain in conformance with uh, the regulatory and other requirements. This has gotten a lot of interest from business in terms of new kinds of services, which I'll describe to you. So I'll skip over this, uh, this same definition again, but... Um, the, uh, uh, I've done this one already. I'm not sure even why that's in there now. Workflow to date, uh, in terms of evaluation of workflows, or validation is really what it is. Basically, it's workflow validation. It's, say, a workflow has a, an ending. Uh, there are no loops in the workflow. Very simple concepts uh, in, in used in validation. But evaluation of workflow would require this contextual knowledge, and there's virtually nothing that has been done on that. So answering the question like, is this an appropriate process or is this process better than another, has been impossible. So the same goal of research back again. Clearly, the, the workflow representation needs to be multidimensional. Uh, both the syntactic and semantic dimensions need to be included. This is a diagram we've used. It has a lot of limitations, but it kind of gets a picture for you of what we're talking about. Think about a patient. Think of this thing as rotating. Patient in the middle. Patient has clinical problems, which are the diagnoses, let's say, there is a clinical protocol describing how to deal with that set of clinical problems that it needs to be can taken into account. There's an operational workflow, which is how the department wants to execute things. So you think of this going around, all these things influence a choice point here where a set of services on the shelf are selected and concatenated uh, in real time to serve the particular patient 
the particular processes, the particular protocol, et cetera. Uh, this is the historic workflow then, is the selection of these services in time. This is the historic record, which is in fact the workflow that was created. And this just recognizes this diagram that when you choose a service, the service may be changed, adapted. Very much this is like a service-oriented architecture concept, uh, but where you may parameterize the service in some way based on the specifics of these various uh, sub-workflows or protocols, or whatever you want to call them. So that's the idea. And the historic workflow would be the sequence that came from this. So uh, right now, the concept of workflow at, as a dynamic workflow really has two components, a, a decision unit, which looks at whatever the knowledge base is and uh, selects a service. I mean, that's all you can describe without a workflow beforehand in a totally dynamic workflow. So the decision unit uh, might be some sort of an inference engine. Uh, the concepts that are involved might be part of a uh, typical knowledge base. So the concept here is that uh, knowledge about the process uh, and about all the services and so on would be available to this decision unit and in choosing the appropriate next service, which itself might be rechosen by a human being. The characteristics of the services, each service will have prerequisites. You can't do this before you do that. Classic thing would be you'd have to inject contrast material, if that's a service, before you do the computed tomographic examination. There's a, you need, there's a, there's a sequence there uh, if you want certain results. Now, you can do it without that, but you won't get the results that you wanted. So it is true that every service will have things uh, descri described with it that say, you're going to choose this service, you have to do things this way. And if you do this service, you're going to have to do things that way when it's done. The point is you can enter a process at any point based on only meeting these pre and post requisites. But the history of this is, in fact, the workflow instance. Now, I won't go into the, the deep details of this, but I want to point out some of the concepts here and what the, what the importance of this is. Um, we, we had a term we called workflow coupling. And it really should be workflow, computing workflow, human workflow coupling is a better description. But the idea is to be able to customize systems so they support what's desired by a, uh, a client. Recognize that a high percentage of system code is in fact used for workflow support, and we can bring this workflow out in the form of representations. This is a simple departmental information system that has a bunch of functions it performs might be register a patient, do a report. Whatever those are, it doesn't really matter. It's just symbolic. Program here. There's a workflow process. If this were a completely non-automated process, uh, these are the steps, the tasks that are done by human beings entirely on their own. The issue in systems is to somehow make these things interact as uh, synergistically as possible. So this symbolizes that task one needs to still part of it be done by a person well, part of it can be automated. Tasks three and four can be completely automated and so on. And there might be some manual tasks as well that can only be done by the human being. This indicates that some of them are partially manual at least. So staff do this part and the system does this part. This would be a very good uh, workflow uh, or work process coupling environment. If you've done as much as possible using the system and, use, and as efficiently as possible using the human. A bad process is one that really forces you to do a lot of things manually, only automates some of what you're doing or assists some of what you're doing. We use the term facilitate it rather than automate it. And actually causes you to create additional work. If you want an example of that in diagnostic imaging departments, if you study them, you have people filing pieces of paper that are produced by the computer. So they take it and put it in a file cabinet. Why? I mean, often compulsive behavior. Sometimes there may be a regulatory requirement and the system doesn't properly uh, file them and, and hold them in a way that, that it needs to. So they have to do this because the system is incomplete. It could either be that they're dumb or the system is dumb, whichever way you want to do it. So that's what we mean by good coupling of workflows. The ability of, of the, uh, uh, workflow technology allows us to adapt systems so that we have them that are uh, as, as, as close as possible to what people need. It can be done by domain experts instead of programs, programmers. The work is self-documenting because a workflow describes itself. It's, it's readable. Uh, interestingly, related to this work, there are some really interesting product and services opportunities. Obviously, you can customize products much more 
by ordinary people with, with this. So a product can have a lot more adaptability, variability uh, for the environment. The services opportunities are very, very interesting. It's now conceivable. Uh, I have you've heard the idea that in the, few, in the past, we delivered systems. Then there are consultants who delivered re-engineering with systems. And so they help you integrate as effectively as possible the systems into your, your environment. Uh, however, the future is we deliver departments, we deliver businesses. So instead, we, we literally say, here's the whole thing. In fact, if you want us, we'll give you the chairs, we'll give you the space, we'll, re we'll renovate the space or build the building. You deliver businesses. This goes a long way toward this concept because now I can have on the shelf the Mayo Clinic's way of running a diagnostic imaging department. Vanderbilt University's way of running a medical center's way of running a diagnostic imaging department. And I can take that as an exemplar and I can execute it on my system. And I can vary it. I can mix them. I can take the reception way they do it at Mayo and the reporting way they do it at Vanderbilt and I can combine them onto a system, taking those hunks of process and actually using that kind of process in my organization. So there's a huge potential of having uh, pieces of workflow on the shelf which are very highly uh, spe specialized and, uh, sorry, very carefully described and very efficient and so on, and using them much the way one can have software components on the shelf in a services-oriented architecture. So that's the kind of uh, uh, potential. And obviously, uh, if you're going to have a system in the human environment, if you're going to say that your investment in systems produces benefits for your environment, you need something like this. So some of the things uh, vendors have an interest in this is that they can customize systems uh, and win procurements. A uh, professional services company can offer new kinds of services where you have workflows on the shelf. So it's productizing workflow. Health organizations can come up with better ways of doing things uh, using these, these workflow components and hopefully they get a better return on the investment they have in systems, at least in enhanced productivity. Uh, some of the workflow products that we've dis discussed with companies include prepackaged business processes or components, exemplar departments, uh, yet delivering organizations, uh, database of workflows for mining. So as you produce the results, these historic workflows, they can be mined. Uh, they can be mined in many different environments and you can find the best or most efficient or some mixture uh, on, some, on some criteria. It's interesting, if you have these things, you can simulate the environment. And one of the pieces of research we're interested in, and we've done some parts of this, is we take a workflow description, and we take a department description, and we execute the workflow description in the department description. So you see the workflow with little icons that show you how it'll work in that spatial environment. It'll be critically important because of the physical bounds that you have on something may prevent certain things from occurring. So it allows the, the mixture, if you want, of, of the ability to do things, and ultimately you can optimize parts uh, of the workflow, if not the whole workflow. I just want to point out that, uh, I won't have time to go into a lot of these, but the slides you can look through, is uh, we need to be able to capture uh, all of these uh, aspects of workflow and translate them into some form, typically representation and a declarative form is our interest, that allow us to capture this, these other dimensions of the environment. And in the past, this work has not been done by an analyst. Um, and one of our objectives is, in the future, to be evaluate workflows and be able to detect inappropriate workflows so we can find inefficiencies, uh, unnecessarily complex, or uh, things that go against standards, or go against the goals of the organization in some way, or are not optimal with respect to that. And the question is, of course, can you, from the beginning, if you have a description of what you want to accomplish in a business, can you go the other way and can you define a workflow based on that description of the business? That's a much more challenging problem. Uh, this slide just shows some of the steps. We're working on something we've called the Structured Workflow Analysis Package, which gives some indication of the number of things you have to capture related to these uh, different dimensions in order to uh, represent this uh, contextual knowledge, and which goes on for another slide uh, and another. And this is still in development. This is uh, work that was also uh, uh, done by Ken McKay. So that's kind of an overview of uh, the work that we've done. And we have several people here. Uh, Bill Malik, who's doing his, uh, finishing his master's and going to do his PhD in this area. Majed al Shala, who's just beginning his PhD in this area. He's done quite a bit of work on it previously with uh, Costas Cantabianas. So people here who 
you don't really know the depth of this kind of stuff and uh, can answer questions probably better than I can. I want to point out that um, th this is an important area in health informatics in the uh, world of uh, medicine. I recognize that the health system is critically dependent on information and communications technologies. And one, in a paper about five, six years ago, one of the ten grand challenges in health informatics was developing techniques to ease the incorporation of new information management technologies into the infrastructure of organizations. But if you search health informatics, you find almost no work being done in workflow. It's all being done in other industries. So it's a latecomer to the health care, health systems industry. Uh, we have a critical need uh, to adapt systems to the work processes of organizations and dynamically alter those. And uh, to get domain experts rather than programmers to be able to interact with systems and achieve the uh, coupling of these systems with their environments, very, very big problem and usually impossible with uh, past technologies. Uh, what's interesting is that at Waterloo here, this is health informatics itself is a major, not just workflow, but health informatics is a major uh, strategic objective. I'll skip over the, uh, this. I want to point out, by the way, uh, people who are uh, students have been working with us, uh, we need about, and this has been estimated by Canada Health Infoway, which is a federal organization, about a couple billion right now, billion and a half, and SSHA, which has got about a half a billion, is an Ontario uh, Technology Deployment Agency for Healthcare. We need about 2,000 additional health informatics professionals and less than 70, in fact, are produced across the whole country every year. And although there are a lot of programs ramping up, uh, even Conestoga College here, we've helped them with that, it's going to take five years before we can do this, and yet we need the people right now. So we have a, a dramatic crisis related to human resources, and it's hitting the newspapers uh, because the government, in order to do some of its e-health, as they call electronic health initiatives, has had to go and hire zillions of consultants at $300,000 a day. And that's created a little bit of concern among uh, people, particularly the ordinary citizenry, where that, that takes care of your taxes for a long, long time. Uh, so we have a major crisis. And i uh, just point out that this is an area that is going to be a very important area, this particular area of workflow. I mentioned our collaborators, and I think I've captured everybody. It keeps growing, but uh, Don Cowan, uh, computer science, Ken McKay. Ken has been invaluable because he wrote a book just recently on workflow in manufacturing, and uh, particularly focusing on job shops, where the work that comes in determines what you do. And it's very variable and very, according to what you find while you're you know, fixing the helicopter blades, uh, changes everything. So that influenced a great deal uh, the way we've been looking at workflow in the healthcare environment. He's in management sciences. Paul Ankar is a formal methods type in computer science. I mentioned Custos Contagianis. He's in engineering, and this is one of the areas he's working in. Our staff, Shirley, Doug, uh, Kyle Young, and so on, and students, uh, Mah Majed, uh, uh, Weijin Dai, David Enriquez, Harry Lung, uh, Bill Malik, uh, David C., and Joel So is a new one. Uh, the productivity, interestingly, what we're doing in a separate project, which is not going to be at all uh, dealt with here, is we're looking at when you have systems and you do them properly, uh, how, how, do, how do you get systems that actually have an economic impact in the healthcare environment? It's a huge problem. This is the team of people that's been working on this in various departments, economics, uh, management sciences, accountancy, and uh, a school of optometry. Uh, this work is meant to look at the effects of systems uh, in the environment, showing that they do, in fact, improve things, which is very, very, very difficult to show. And there's a diagram here of our team. Um, uh, and then finally, our, our funding uh, things here. So open to questions, comments, or anything. Bill might also, and Jed might want to uh, touch on things I've left out. So in order to do that, I've got a microphone to give to you, and I'll act as both MC and jack of all trades here. So comments or questions? Do you want to say something? Okay, about my work, I've been actually involved in implementing some of this stuff. I've tried to lay a framework in my MMath thesis. What I've done is built an extensible system for workflow 
with the idea being it will be applied to healthcare. So I've looked at, first I developed the requirements for such a system, mainly based on the things that Dominic has gone through already and then some other things I saw in particular systems that do not work. And we came up with this idea, of course, of assembled versus prescribed workflow. There were other things. I looked at the role relationships you require in workflow, uh, the fact that you don't often couple things correctly, like you have, um, as we've said, the relationships in healthcare are pretty uh, complex. So you're looking at things like whether a nurse or doctor will do a job. Typically, this is not represented well in most workflow representations. So I've gone ahead and built this extensible system which has the role relationships built in. It has this concept of prescribed and assembled workflow. And I built the representation using database technologies based on the work of Michael Jackson. He produces um, ER diagrams at a very high level which represent essentially how your system fits together. We have things like life cycles, stages, tasks. This is a model we use for workflow wherein we're looking at the entities of the system. So something like an agent, we will couple that with a life cycle or several life cycles the agent passes through while they're in the system. This agent could be the patient or it could be something else we're looking at, like say a diagnostic imaging order, how it works through the system. So it will have a life cycle, like for an order, this life cycle will be presented to someone in administration who will fill in some kind of um, when it was received, what sort of details about the patient itself. It will then be passed to a radiologist who might fill in more details. This is a life cycle with particular stages that happen in some kind of order. Now this is the sort of prescribed idea, but once you get into these stages, what you really have are a bunch of tasks, as we said, that are selected rather than prescribed. So working by the, the Jackson model and then some extensions I've done, I've pretty much produced uh, a representation of workflow that reflects what we're talking about here and it has the ability to capture some of these contextual concerns as is, but it has the ability also to extend it. So you have this very loose rule base by which your workflow representation will be interpreted by your system. So you can go ahead and uh, add things like the process map capabilities, the idea of the when, the where, the how. These can be added to your system after. You can produce rules as a second input to your workflow engine, and then I built the actual workflow engine that takes this say process map or this high level workflow description in a declarative form and turns it into something you can actually implement. Now that's about the best five minute description I can give you of my system. You're free to ask questions about how I implemented it and what I want to do with it now. So I'll take those. Just talk over what the last one is. I'm coming from the consulting board. Then. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. And, and stand over at work. Bill, can you? Um, I'm coming from the consulting board. And one of the changes that we faced in workflows is basically not only that we forgot usually about capturing all the dimensions, but those dimensions changes with who is looking at the task. You can think of uh, um, taking an imagery for an x-ray or something like this, and the patient will look at this task and say, oh, there is a waiting uh, time, or there is uh, no cost because it's a public uh, service. Uh, I have to do it. So. These things, and the, and the physician will look at this, uh, this is as a must to do to uh, come up with a judgment. Uh, uh, the cost is paid by the government. The value of it is very important for the patient to uh, take a decision. Uh, so everybody looks at this task and builds his own net of, uh, uh, I'll say, flows of things. So if, if we take this diagram, a ministry will look at the workflow and build something like this. A patient will look at this workflow and build completely different something because the values are different, the costs are different, the objectives are different. And also um, the hospital will look at this and see something completely different. So this is not only multidimensional, but also the complexity of the dimensions increases if you add who is looking at the thing. And I think one of the work that I'm uh, working on is 
capturing viewpoints, looking at the task and building uh, viewpoints of these things, of the knowledge or the contextual knowledge around those tasks. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice today, so I apologize. And Majed's just uh, written a little paper about this, too, so that uh, people are interested in this. Uh, he's, uh, I think, uh, the second newest member of our team, so we're very fortunate that he joined us. So any other final comments or questions, or I don't leave anybody behind? Yes? It was mentioned somewhere that there is an effort to perform optimization of the process. How is that going to be? undertaken mathematically or heuristically? Well, knowing the uh, management science people will be done mathematically. <laughs> I, I expect, I, my, that's my expectation. A very strong OR orientation in, in the uh, management sciences group. So I don't know the answer to that though, really. Any other questions or comments? Back there. Um, is there any work has been done um, in the effect of workflow on human being in terms of the um, the adaptation or the acceptance, the interaction with the workflow? There has been uh, work done on uh, looking at clinical protocols and then uh, asking usability questions. Uh, this would be properly in the area often called usability, which is not a field I'm current in, but uh, here at the university, a good person to answer that would be uh, um, Jose Orocha in Applied Health Sciences. The, uh, but the people who have looked at the uh, uh, pr clinical protocols have, have noted that uh, you know, they're just not followed in a lot of situations. And uh, one of the complaints, I read one paper which indicated that the, the biggest single problem was the temporal, rigid, rigid temporal relationship among the steps. It was do this, then do that. And we don't act that way. We act very intuitively. Uh, we go this way and then follow rules. And we, if we have to do something for, oh, yeah, I've got to do that, we go back. But we tend to enter processes at any point with a very intuitive approach. And that's not easily represented uh, except in a dynamic, assembled workflow kind of approach. Um, other workflow, I would expect that a great deal has been done. I don't know the answer to this one, but in the um, manufacturing industry in, in car plants. Uh, that uh, in that case, a person needs to interact with a process that goes on and on and on. Uh, way back in the 70s, I was involved in psychiatry, and uh, one of the highest uh, uh, areas of, of uh, uh, delivery of patients for psychiatric treatment came from the assembly plants because of the process that went on. So I'm sure there's a huge amount been done about the uh, psychosocial impacts of working in these very rigid domains. Have you ever seen, um, what was her name? The, I can't remember the, the, the actress, comedian. Um, a very famous thing with uh, chocolate coming out on the, everybody remember this? Um, what's her name? The red-haired woman comedian, husband was a Cuban. For some reason I'm blank. Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball. It's an absolutely fantastic Lucille Ball thing where she's working and there's candy coming out of, on the thing. And they have to take the candy, wrap it up, and put it in a box. And they keep speeding the thing up. And eventually she's stuffing her mouth with it, throwing the candy away. You know, it's a very high pressure environment. And uh, if you, in healthcare, where life and time of the patient and dealing with the patient is, is fundamental, you can't turn it into an assembly line. It just doesn't work. Uh, and you either get breakdown of the humans or breakdown of the process, whichever or both. So, uh, but um, I'm, I'm not really able to answer much better than that. Have you had any experience with that? Yes, I, uh, um, I'm just doing, implementing a new system um, to, um, to evaluate student or for student evaluation online. Um, right now, the staff and faculty members and students doing this on paper. Um, the staff like prepare hundreds of, of uh, evaluation for each student. Um, um, they have to remind the supervisor to to fill the evaluation, they hand in the evaluation paper to the supervisor in the day of the uh, evaluation in the clinic. And the supervisor take the paper, might fill it in in the same time or forgot, if he forgot the, uh, might do it two or three days after. 
uh, he might forget to do it, and the receptionist or the administrator might forget to, to remind him. Uh, what I have done, I implemented a system that do this automatically. All the evaluation paper will go to the supervisor automatically. He, if he doesn't fill it in the same day, he will get a reminder email um, right away. Uh, if two, two days he hasn't filled it in, he will get a reminder email. At the end, like all the students will get evaluated the same number of times, and um, probably everyone will be doing less work uh, than before. So it's sort of a, uh, I'll call it a document management type, uh, uh, like an insurance company workflow type of thing. Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems is... I just got your microphone, because we have a, I didn't mention, but we have a uh, person on by webcast, and we also record these sessions. So. One of the problems that we have is actually most of the process management systems or workflow management systems is built by technology companies or technology people. And... It's adapted in a human-intensive environment like healthcare or even in, in, uh, in normal businesses where w there, is, there is a difference between the science and the arts part of any business. There are science things which you can actually capture and put in workflows, and there's the arts. There is the human brain thing. I need to take a decision right now because I feel that this is the right way to do it. I can't even put the workflow for it, but based on my experience, based on, so, so there is a lot of things that you can't capture in the workflow, and this is where workflows usually failed. Uh, you can deal with, uh, with the things by putting alarms or sending emails or using Blackberries or uh, tablet PCs, but what we forgot about is that there is an art piece of this whole thing called workflow that uh, is missing from the picture. Yeah, there will be definitely an, a, that art part. Uh, the, what I didn't mention is that not only is the activity uh, multi-dimensionally, uh, has uh, multi-dimensions, but every agent has multiple dimensions. Every object has multiple dimensions. So that, uh, I mean, in as much as we can represent that, we capture it, and if we can't, we don't. So if we know the decision parameters and the criteria, used by the decision maker, I mean, then, then we know the, the possibilities of decisions. We don't know which one will be made, but we know the general environment in which they occur. Uh, but more and more about the environment needs to be represented uh, beyond what we've got here. Um, anyway, thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And to the person who's come in by webcast, uh, thank you for joining us.